Ah, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We got a great show for you today. As always, we are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. So however you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, today's a big old Thursday. We got game two of the NBA Finals on tonight, folks. I cannot wait. So we're going to break down the game, preview it, and get our moneymaker. Try to get that thing back on track. That is just gone off the rails these past couple of weeks folks i'm apologizing but we're about to get back on track we're about to steal the steer the wheels back on course and hit some money tonight Jeez, louise so we've got that to do uh we may be able to get to the wild card game 2016 of the packers and giants giving aaron Rodgers a score does he deserve credit for that big old win that they had so we'll look at that as well and, uh, you know, we've got, you know, what we do here on the show. So let's just jump right into it with the stories of the day. And we may have to take a little bit of a timeout today on the show. We are watching these cards. They just dropped today. These Don Russ 2021 Elite cards. They started at $600 a box. And there's no way in hell we are paying $600 a box. But how they do it on this website, it drops in price every five minutes. And it can go all the way down to $200. And that's a little... We don't want to spend $200, but we will uh, for some of these good cards in here that we may be able to pull. They are also first off the line edition. So there's a couple more bonus cards you get in the box. So um, right now it's at $400. It started at $600. And in the last hour, it's dropped to 200 bucks. So we're going to kind of wait another hour for it to drop another 200 bucks. So maybe around the 1 o'clock mark, uh, we will have to kind of take a little bit of a time out in the show and purchase those cards if they are still available. So bear with us if that happens, and we'll make it entertaining. We'll try. Uh, So let's just jump right into it with the stories of the day. And the first one up, let's start here talking about Doug Peterson again. All righty. He's no longer a Philadelphia Eagles head coach. Unfortunate. We feel for the man. We truly believe he is a real solid coach. I'd put him in top 10 coaches in the league. Do I go that far? Do I go that high on the man? It's uh, Seattle Pete Carroll. I put him in top 10. Sean McVay, I put him in top 10. Cliff Kingsbury, I put him potentially in top 10. Maybe we'll put him at top 15. Kyle Shanahan, I mean, you got to put him somewhere. Definitely top 10. He's been into the Super Bowl a couple of times. So the NFC West definitely has a stacked coaching roster. Sean Payton, you got to put in top 10. Bruce Aarons, you got to put in top 10. Uh, Yeah, maybe there is no room for Doug Peterson in the top 10. Uh, Matt Rule, he's not even in the top 10. 30, and there's 32 teams, folks. Um, Atlanta's new head coach, can't put him in there. Ron Rivera, uh, top 15, top 10. Let's set him in the top 15. Um, Joe Judge for the Giants, he's not top 15. Mike McCarthy, like we said, that man's not even top 30, folks. Um, Nick Sirianni, new head coach for the Eagles, no way. Uh, Matt LaFleur, I think I'd put him in top 10. He's real solid, potentially top 15. Matt Nagy, he's definitely top 15. We'll see if he can kind of move into the top 10 now. Uh, Mike Zimmer, yeah, maybe top 20. Dan Campbell, 30th, 32nd. So, I mean, these are the worst head coaches in the league, folks. I mean, Dan Campbell, Mike McCarthy, and um, Matt Rule. I mean, we're not big fans of them. Um, what do we got for the, uh, yeah, so the Lions. So, I mean, the NFC really has, how many did we say? We said Matt LaFleur, Ron Rivera, potentially, Sean Payton. And then everybody in the NFC West. So that's, uh, we got six top 10 head coaches just in the NFC alone, folks. Then we go to the AFC. Mike Vrabel, do, I think we put him in top 15. Um, Frank Reich, maybe top 20-ish, uh, real solid there. Uh, new head coach for the Texans, nowhere near there. Urban Meyer, unproven, can't put, can't put him in the top 10. Sean McDermott, we can definitely probably put in the top 10 there. Bill Belichick, obviously we got to put in the top 10. Um, Brian Flores, I would say top 15, real close entering that top 10 territory. Mike Tomlin, I would kind of say top 15. I don't know about top 10 just because of, you know, he's had Big Ben his entire career and they've kind of underperformed in some situations. He led him to the Super Bowl, so definitely kind of top 15-ish, but maybe, 
Uh, I don't know. They went they went uh, eight and eight with no Big Ben that year when he kind of went down early, and they had to use Mason Rudolph and you know the 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 three Stooges that they had at quarterback there. So potentially Mike Tomlin, you can make the argument for top ten. John Harbaugh got to probably put in top. Ugh, he's another tough one. One ring with Joe Flacco, but wh- you know that's that was really it. You know, making it work with Lamar Jackson in this talented roster. So kind of in the same territory that we're kind of talking with um um uh, Mike Tomlin and potentially right on that border of top 10 and top 15. We'll slide him in the top 10. Uh Andy Reid got to put in top 10 and that's really it. So uh, Doug Peterson could definitely kind of be and uh, like number 9, 10, 11, 12 right in that nice range of top 15 and top 10. So yeah, I would say top top 12ish in the league. I've got no problem saying that. All right, so now we're talking about Doug Peterson. Unfortunately, he does not have a head coaching job, and that makes us a little upset. We would like to see this man still in the league. I mean, there's countless. I mean, folks, I mean, like we said, he's top 10, co- top 12 coaches in this league. So those other 20 teams, y'all need to get rid of your head coach and hire this man. So he's taking the year off of coaching, unfortunate, but we get another kind of inside look of really what was going on with this Eagles team this season that just kind of unraveled. They got rid of Carson Wentz, they got rid of Doug Peterson, and are kind of just moving on decent little rebuild. So we get another inside look of that. So Doug Peterson says the Eagles didn't draft Jalen Hurts to undermine Carson Wentz and said that Carson Wentz was definitely our starter. He was the franchise. So once again, we, you know, that's kind of what we were thinking that, you know, you draft Jalen Hurts just to kind of have a solid backup. Carson Wentz was still the face of the franchise. I just never, I just don't think that was ever truly communicated all the way down the line from the general manager to the head coach to Carson Wentz. And I think that's where all the really dysfunction came in the kind of, you know, upsetness that Carson Wentz just had overall uh, with the Philadelphia organization. So let's go into this article right here and let's kind of see, did they have a game plan with Carson Wentz? And if this was truly the case, I don't understand why we got rid of Doug Peterson in the first place of Philadelphia. So, you know, you're, um, what's the, uh, what's the uh, general manager? It's like how we... Howie something. Let's get that up real quick, just so I have his name right. Eagles general manager. Howie Roseman. Okay. Howie Roseman and then Jeff Lurie, he's the owner? Was he the owner? Who was Howie? uh, Jeffrey Lurie. Yeah, Jeffrey Lurie. So Jeffrey Lurie's the owner. Lurie is the owner. Howie Roseman is the general manager, and Doug Peterson was the head coach, as we're kind of you know talking about last season. So you draft Jalen Hurts, and then you've got this solid quarterback at number two with Carson Wentz still being your starter. And then you know as the season progresses, whose actual call was it to bench Carson Wentz? Did that come from the top? Did that come from the owner, Jeffrey? Lurie, Lowry, however you pronounce it, it's L U R L U R I E. So I'm I'm taking it as Lurie for now. Um, Lowry does come off the tongue better though. <laughs> uh, but did that come down from the owner, the general manager, or was that Doug Peterson's call? Because we heard Doug Peterson in another quote earlier, you know, a couple weeks ago when we you know talked about this as well. That there was kind of just a mutual decision to move on, and we didn't really get anything of who truly made the call. So, did Doug Peterson make the call, and the general manager didn't like it, so they let um, Doug Peterson go? But, you know, and that kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, Carson Wentz was the franchise, and, you know, the general manager didn't like that, so they sent out Doug Peterson, but then they also got rid of Carson Wentz. But if you knew you were going to get rid of Carson Wentz, not why not keep the good coach that has led you to successful seasons time and time and time again every time he's been here in this in the – uh, as the, as the head coach for the Eagles, so we 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 just want to get to the bottom of truly why Doug Peterson was let go. We don't really see a reasoning why. So let's see if we get any more information here with what Doug Peterson is saying. So here we go. <clears throat> let's start here. All right, now head coach Doug Peterson is gone. In all right, let's start at the top. They say anything good here? A year ago, at this time, the Philadelphia Eagles selection of Jalen Hurts was still somewhat 
puzzling. And yeah, once again, if you knew that Carson Wentz was your franchise, why are you going after Jalen Hurts still kind of early in the draft? It's still, you know, nothing is adding up here in Philadelphia, and that's why we're trying to get to the bottom of it. it we want to know the, the full extent to it, because you don't just get rid of your starting quarterback, and you don't just get rid of a Super Bowl winning head coach just like that in a rebuild for Jalen Hurts, who should be solid, and then Nick Sirianni, who, you know, has never been a head coach. He's an offensive coordinator, not a head coach. So, real kind of question marks here. But let's continue on. Uh, would, he offer the, would he offer the Eagles another element for their offense, a Taysom Hill of sorts? Was the quarterback of the future when the franchise quarterback was still in his prime years? Now head coach Doug Peterson is gone, and so too is quarterback Carson Wentz following a disaster of a 2020 season in which Hurts' potential was the only highlight to emerge after Wentz turned in his worst career campaign and Peterson oversaw an NFC worst for 11-1 showing. So they just had one bad year, and we know they had a bad year, but we chalked that all up to, you know, Carson Wentz just kind of be feeling a little disrespected by the franchise overall, kind of like what Aaron Rodgers was feeling. Hey, you know, instead of getting me a little bit more help, you're going to draft my replacement, even though you're telling me I'm the face of the franchise, and you also told me the same thing when Nick Foles won the Super Bowl, but then you have a statue of him outside of the stadium. So I'm getting mixed signals here. You're saying one thing and doing another, so I'm I'm just going to quit on the year. I'm just going to let the ball fly. And if it's a touchdown, great for me. If it's a pick, that's on y'all because I'm out next year. So we just want to get to the bottom of what truly went down in Philadelphia. And everybody's kind of, you know, putting on a smile and there's nobody's blaming each other. Start blaming each other so we can pick up some nuggets of information. Everyone's like, oh, it's just, you know, a mutual breakup. It was a mutual breakup of Carson Wentz. It was a mutual breakup of Doug Peterson. It can't just be everybody mutually agreeing out here. Doug Peterson's not a head coach anymore. You you don't think, you know, he wouldn't be fighting for his job of Philadelphia if he didn't think that he had a job lined up? I think he would have fought a little bit harder if he knew, hey, I have to sit out for a year. I don't think he wanted to do that. No way. It's hard to get a head coaching job in this league, especially if you're going to take a year off. Yes, we know you won a Super Bowl. That was a couple of years ago, and you haven't coached in, in a year, and the league changes every year just like this. So why don't you start as an offensive coordinator? Then work your way back up. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Jason Garrett, unfortunately, had to do that. Um, unfortunately. I think he is a better offense coordinator than he is a head coach, but... All right, what else do we got here? Got to get to this quote. Um, Much ado has been made about the Eagles drafting of Hurts in the second round of the 2020 NFL Draft as the starting point for the disharmony that undid the club from within. Truly that. However, Peterson is adamant. Stop. Ugh, stop being adamant. Uh, Peterson is adamant that picking Hurts wasn't done to undercut Wentz, but because in the NFL you're always looking for quarterbacks, especially in the case of a franchise that's lone Super Bowl victory was led by a backup quarterback. Quote, you know, this is from Doug Peterson. Quote, you know, you go into drafts and you go into each year looking for quarterbacks and we continue to look for quarterbacks and that's always something that will never change. We won a Super Bowl with our backup quarterback and we've had to play with our backups a couple of times in Philadelphia. And that is true. That was kind of the big, that's the only knock really on Carson Wentz. He can stay healthy. So, you know, we can understand that, at, you know, kind of in the business, the general manager, the front office side of the Eagles that, hey, let's get a solid backup because we most likely will need him. But that needs to be communicated 100%. You need to make Carson Wentz feel like no matter what, you will always be the starter. This is just kind of a little bit of an insurance policy. And, you know, we just have to do this. And maybe Carson Wentz understands or maybe he doesn't. He leaves either way. All right, so uh, back to the quote. Uh, so we did that a year ago and brought in Jalen Hurts, not to undermine Carson Wentz, not to do anything to take away his job or anything, because Carson was definitely our starter. He was the franchise and all that moving forward. But someone that could come in and could be the backup and learn how to play the NFL game, bring his talents to the Philadelphia Eagles. So 
Once again, I just don't think there was great communication here in the Eagles. I believe they had in mind, you know, the mindset that Carson was the starter, but also in the back of their mind, they're like, this man's not reliable. So, uh, you know, we've got to just be ready for that at a moment's notice. And I think Carson Wentz took that as a little bit of a slight, a little bit of a dig, and just kind of, you know, everything that's been happening previously – the Eagles giving all the credit to his kind of Super Bowl. He got them to the playoffs, folks. He put them in the position to get to the Super Bowl. We are not taking anything away from Nick Foles because he's the one that actually went out and did it on the field. So we give credit to Nick Foles for that. But we've seen what Nick Foles can do in the regular season. It's trash. It's absolutely trash. The man caught magic. The man caught momentum. And it led him to the Super Bowl. We've seen this before. The the Giants. Both years that they won the Super Bowl against Tom Brady. They were going into the playoffs like 9-7. Nothing great. Eli Manning catches magic. The defense catches magic. And they win the Super Bowl. This is not out of the realm of what happens in the NFL. But you do need somebody that can get you into the playoffs to set you up for that. Because if you don't get into the playoffs... If, you, if you're not good in the regular season, you're not going to get into the playoffs for that magical run. So I think that Carson Wentz was like, hey, I would like a little bit more credit. I don't need all the credit, but I want way more than what you guys are giving me. And I never thought, and I really don't think the coaching staff and the owner, the management here in Philadelphia was truly letting Carson Wentz get the recognition and the respect that he still kind of deserved for his play in the regular season. All right, do we get any more quotes here? We get one more. Here we go. Or maybe two more. Here we go. <clears throat> Injury woes from seasons past in Wentz's play dropped drastically. It was a free fall in Peterson's eyes, but one he was hoping to pilot the franchise out from. That chance wasn't afforded to him. However, Wentz has been shipped off to Indianapolis, and Peterson is walking the earth looking for a new opportunity instead of walking the Philly sideline. Quote, and really, as the season began, things just started to kind of, I guess, spiral out of control. Injuries began to set in. And once again, we saw that. And Carson Wentz always overcame those wide receiver injuries. Carson Wentz has never really had a full, healthy team. Either he's injured or, you know, the, the wide receivers and the weapons are injured. We, we saw that time and time again. So once again, why are we getting rid of Doug Peterson when just injuries every single year at every major position? And he's still having viable, competitive seasons I don't get the I don't get the breakup of Doug Peterson that's what we kind of understand what was happening with Carson Wentz but what the heck was getting rid of Doug Peterson what was that accomplishing we don't we don't get it but let's continue here. Injuries began to set in. Quote, uh, we weren't playing very well. Turnovers <laughs> offensively. And yeah, I mean, Carson Wentz had 15 and he even played the entire season. How uh, That was real bad. Um, but once again, he was just letting it fly. I don't care, man. I'm done. I'm done after this year. I'm just going to let the ball fly. That's it. I'm going to show what I got. I'm going to showcase my arm. And, you know, hey, it, if it's turnovers, I don't care. I'm not here next year. I do not care. Bye. <laughs> Um, but here we go. Back to the quote. Uh, turnovers offensively, just a number of things, penalties, more injuries, compounded problems, and it just became harder and harder as the year wore on. No one person is to blame for any of what happened last year, and it's just unfortunate for me because I was hoping to really have an opportunity to fix the issues that we had and kind of get everything back on track. Whether it was going to be this year or next year, and obviously that didn't happen, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the ifs, and and butts. I just focus on the future and I look forward to that. All right, last uh, quote here. <clears throat> Obviously, my goal in my hiring in 2016 was to hopefully bring a championship to Philadelphia, and we accomplished that in our second year there. Fantastic. I mean, once again, year two and you win a ring, then injuries start to set in. Carson Wentz is still getting injured. Wide receivers are still getting injured, and he's still having decent seasons, folks. Decent seasons. Uh, quote, so I look back on my time there. There was a lot of positives I take from it, but I'm not going to dwell too much on the past. I'm going to learn from it, obviously, and hopefully if I can get an opportunity to coach again, which I hope I can do, and we definitely hope he does as well, and we truly foresee him getting another coaching job, we'll see which coaches flounder this season and get the boot, whether mid-season, late season, because Doug Peterson's going to be candidate number one for really any head coaching openings. Uh, and I'll I'll take the good with me. So 
We don't get any information. We just want to know why Doug Peterson was fired. That's it. That's it. Can somebody tell us that? That's all we want to know. We know why Carson Wentz left. We know why he was kind of, you know, a little pushed out. Why did Doug Peterson have to go as well? I would trust Jalen Hurts. I would trust D Doug Peterson to mentor and shape Jalen Hurts. Absolutely. He's not having that chance. And could you imagine finally a great wide receiver in Devontae Smith? Hopefully he can stay healthy. He, don't, he doesn't get that chance. Unfortunate. All right, let's move on here. All right, <clears throat> next, uh, next uh, two stories here are from Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay. They were just on a podcast together, and we got some decent kind of digs and nuggets of information here. So we could talk about this. So Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay, they seem to be real kind of buddies. They kind of, you know, are friends in real life. So, you know, them being on the podcast together, they were kind of, you know, talking freely and taking subtle kind of, hey, hey. So here we go. Let's get into this. So Shanahan was recently on the flying coach, the flying couch. That's coach. Yeah, coach. <laughs> the flying coach podcast with McVay and Peter Schrager. McVay ribbed Shanahan, asking the Niners coach how he liked the Rams' new addition. Quote from Kyle Shanahan, you don't want to get me started, dude. That was frustrating. I was in Cabo. I was studying it all. I remember looking through it because everybody was telling me it was a possibility. Stafford's the man. I studied him hard coming out of college, and you always play against him, so you know how good he is. But to know he might be a, uh, might be available and to spend two weeks really watching him, Sean, yeah, he's better than I realize. He was the man. He's actually underrated to me. I know how good of a guy you got. I know how good he is at play action. I know how smart he is. Not only does he just have a big arm, but he's got touch. He knows where to go with the ball. So I was trying to get involved. So I mean, once again, I mean, everybody's still gushing over Matt Stafford and we understand the gush folks. It was just truly that Lions team for his entire career was nothing great. He had Megatron and they were getting it done during those Megatron years, folks. They just never had the coaching staff, the defense to truly put them over the edge. You can't win in this league with just a good quarterback and wide receiver. You need the great head coach. You need a real good defense. That's why Bill Belichick is... Probably just the smartest mind in the NFL. He's probably the greatest individual part of a dynasty ever because he realized that you don't need the receivers. You don't need A1 tier 1 wide receivers. You don't need A1 tier 1 running backs. You need an A1 tier 1 quarterback. You need a smart head coach and Bill Belichick. You got to give him some credit. I don't care how much credit you give him, but you have to give him some credit for just his intelligence overall of football and you need a good defense. And that's what Bill Belichick's specialty was. So I'm going big on defense and I'm going to let Tom do his thing because I believe and I trust. I know Tom can do it. And Tom went out and did it. And Bill went out and coached the defense. And they won ring after ring after ring after ring. Best dynasty of my lifetime. Potentially greatest dynasty of all time. You can make the argument. I would most likely agree. So this is how you do it, folks. And that Lions team had none of that. They had the quarterback. They didn't have the coach. They didn't have the defense. You need those other two parts, folks. This is not basketball. It's not one guy can take over. It's not if you have a LeBron James, you're instantly pretty much going to a conference finals. Football's different, folks. There's 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 a hundred people on the sideline every single game, folks. There's two sides of the ball. And then you got special teams mixed in there as well. So you need all three pieces to just be competitive. You know, you're not even guaranteed anything. I mean, we we look at the Chiefs, they got to the Super Bowl. But they lost it, unfortunately. We're looking at kind of this Ravens team. Great defense. They've got the quarterback. They've got the coach. And they can't even get to the conference championships. We've got Buffalo now. Great defense. Great coach. Great quarterback. And they're losing in the AFC championship game. So it's not even like if you have those three pieces, you're guaranteed a ring. You still got to compete with the, the five, six, seven, eight other teams that still kind of have that as, at the base level of all those three great components. And it's still hard to win in this league. So nothing's guaranteed in this league, folks. It's crazy. That's just what makes that Patriots dynasty even more impressive, honestly.
Uh, but back to the quote here by Kyle Shanahan. Quote, I remember Saturday I was so stressed out and finally we talked to someone. It was night. It was seven at night, and they're like, no, nothing's happening with the trade at the earliest until tomorrow, so you can finish your night. So I'm like, all right, I'm done. I put my phone down, talk to Mandy. I'm like, all right, let's go out to dinner. Let's have some drinks. Once again, he's in Cabo, living it up. Bad choice there. There's no offseason in football. You better be in your home base 24-7, or you're going to miss out, and you're going to lose a great quarterback to a division rival. Not great. So the lesson to be learned here is there's no vacation, baby. If you're a head coach and you're taking a vacation, you think Bill Belichick's ever taking a vacation? <laughs> you think Bill Belichick's ever taking a vacation in his life? Um, but back, back to the quote here. So, so I'm like, all right, I'm done. I put my phone down, talk to Mandy. I'm like, all right, let's go out to dinner. Let's have some drinks. Half an hour later, later, my buddy calls me and is like, I'm just telling you, if you want Stafford, you need to get a hold of him right now. I'm like, what do you mean? We just talk to people. I can sleep on this. We'll talk to him tomorrow. I'm just telling you, you need to talk to him right now. And then it was all over. And then uh, uh, McVay says, if it makes you feel any better, it came together faster than I thought it did too. Um, and then Shanahan uh, rebuttals, the fact that I was in Cabo, man, I would have been there and I would have made it really awkward on you two to enjoy it. You would have, you would have had to tell me to leave. So... Just unfortunate, you know, opportunities come and go just like this. In a blink of an eye, your franchise can be set up for the Super Bowl. And in a blink of an eye, you're left with Jimmy Garoppolo and a rookie quarterback that's unproven in this league. How unfortunate for Kyle Shanahan. So that's uh, that's the one thing to talk about here. Unfortunate for Kyle Shanahan, just missing out, try, uh, decided to enjoy Cabo instead of, you know, going after Matt Stafford. But, uh, you know, once again, why we're buying kind of you know this Rams team this season it's not just like you know you know Matthew Stafford's kind of you know uh some people think he's got it some people don't he's really kind of unanimously around the league highly praised folks this man should be able to get it done with the Rams and once again why Sean McVay is kind of on the hot seat this season to be really really good they've got to be Super Bowl contenders they truly have to kind of win the division they truly have to kind of uh, make it to the NFC championship game just to call it a successful year and so we can start kind of you know once again kind of buying back into Sean McVay because once again Sean McVay says hey I I can get it done. I just need the quarterback, and Jared Goff is not the guy. I can get it done now with Matthew Stafford. I've got my guy. I'm ready to rock. It's put up or shut up for Sean McVay. All right, we get uh, one more kind of nugget of it. Oh, let me go back to this because, once again, we're hearing everything. We've talked about, you know, why Sean McVay likes Matt Stafford, and Kyle Shanahan once again kind of agrees with the same thing. He's got the arm. He's got the brain. He's got the touch, folks. You have to be smart in football, folks. That's truly what kind of separates great quarterbacks from good quarterbacks. I don't want to kind of put his name out here, but I am going to kind of do it a little bit. That's why Jameis Winston is a good quarterback. Back, but I, I just don't think he has kind of the the field smart. That's why he throws 30 picks. The man threw 5,000 yards. He is great at football. I do not care. He is a great passer in this league, but I don't think he has kind of the field smart to apply his big, great, talented arm, and it's unfortunate. I'm hoping he learned from Drew Brees. That's why we were kind of glad Jameis Winston went to the Saints to learn under Sean Payton and to learn from one of the greatest to ever do it, Drew Brees. So if he if he is able to kind of have that kind of great mental aspect on the field of reading coverages, reading plays, knowing just how to get it done on the field, Jameis Winston could be top 10 quarterback in this league, folks. We could be. We honestly could be talking about Jameis Winston like we talk about Patrick Mahomes. Honestly, folks. I don't think that's out of the, the realm of thought. The only the only difference between Patrick Mahomes and James Winston is the is the football IQ. They both can make great throws on the run. Um, they both can chuck the ball down the field. They both can get it done. They both throw for 5,000 yards. Just one has, you know, a little bit of a better football IQ overall. And that's the difference between an 8-8 eight and eight season and winning the Super Bowl and going back year two or going back two straight years. That's the difference. So, watch out for the Rams this year, folks. Truly, I, we have them going to the Super Bowl. Colts, Rams, Super Bowl. That's our pick. 
All right, we got one thing to talk about. They talked about uh, Matthew Stafford, but then we also get this kind of little nugget of information as well um, about what Sean McVay thought Kyle Shanahan was going to do in the draft this year. So we heard Kyle Shanahan still kind of wanting to look at quarterbacks and Matthew Stafford. So, you know, once again, he had Jimmy Garoppolo. So, you know, him getting rid of Jimmy Garoppolo was kind of in his plans already as, you know, we saw that he wanted to go out and get Matthew Stafford. So, once again, maybe Kyle Shanahan's like Kyle, uh, like uh, Sean McVay in the sense of, hey, I can get to the Super Bowl. I've proven I can get to the Super Bowl as a head coach, as an offensive coordinator, but I can't just win it with this guy over here. Jimmy Garoppolo's my Jared Goff. I can't win it with the man. I'm sorry. You still need a better quarterback than this man to win the ring. Look at the past Super Bowl winners, folks. Nick Foles is the only outlier. Joe Flacco is a little bit of an outlier as well, if you want to say that. A little bit. He caught magic in being real good. So, you know, the Patrick Mahomes, the Tom Brady's, the Aaron Rodgers, the Drew Brees, the Big Ben's, the Peyton Manning's, that's consistent Super Bowl winners right there. So I can't get it done with Jimmy Garoppolo. I need another guy. So that's kind of, you know, Kyle Shanahan's thinking as well. But let's uh, talk about this now. All right, here we go. During an episode of The Flying Couch. Flying Couch? Is this Coach or Couch? I'm sorry, folks. I don't even know. Coach. I think it's Coach. (laughs) Couch is C-O-U, right? Coach is C-O-A? I'm pretty sure that's right. So The Flying Couch... I just said it again. The flying coach. It just flies off the tongue. Flying couch. Flying couch. Flying coach. Doesn't fly off the tongue as well. Doesn't fly off the flying couch podcast. Uh, But back to this. On the flying coach podcast, the Rams coach said he was among those who thought Shanahan, who joined for uh, this taping of the podcast, was going the Kyle Pitts route. Instead of drafting the quarterback, he was going to go out and get Kyle Pitts. So this is what Sean McVay had to say. Quote, I thought there was a possibility that Shanahan was going to go Pitts at number three. In all seriousness, because he's such a visionary, I'm telling you, I didn't think he was going to be, he was going to be, it was going to be a crazy thought because you go back to when New England had the two tight end set. And they were doing things totally different. And could you imagine George Kittle with Kyle Pitts? Now we're talking about an offense. But once again, Kyle Shanahan can't fully trust Jimmy Garoppolo to A, stay healthy, and to B, get it done. It's unfortunate. He's got a little bit of Carson Wentz in him with the injuries. And then he's got a little bit of Jared Goff of just not getting it done in the big game. So Kyle Shanahan would have loved to have two tight ends like Bill Belichick did with, you know, Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski. They they were getting it done. That was kind of, you know, Gronk's coming out party. They were winning rings and killing people. Literally and figuratively. Um, But, you know, Kyle Shanahan just could not do that because he needed to try and get the quarterback. He needed the quarterback first. And we'll let George Kittle just kind of be A1 tier run all by his lonesome out there, which we know he can do. Uh, But back to the quote here by Sean McVay. Quote, in all seriousness, because he's such a visionary, I'm telling you, I didn't think it was going to be a crazy thought because you go back to when New England had the two tight end set and they were doing things totally different. You think about what Kittle and then the thing that makes sense is that, hey, Jimmy's produced all the way. This isn't a production thing. This is an availability thing. And you're saying we can't have that. Like all the things. Um, who, who's this quote right here? Is this, um, I think this is still a uh, Sean McVay. So quote, uh, but, it, but I was like, if it's not Mac Jones and I hadn't studied Trey just because there wasn't a lot of film exposure going back a couple of years and we weren't in that market. So I didn't know other than watching him throw at his pro day, pro day that you're saying, all right, you can see a lot of the things that you would like in that would make sense. And then we get this. McVay noted that his good buddy even had their division rivals second guessing. Quote by Sean McVay. He had everybody fooled and he and he got the people that he knew would be looking to fool us as well. So everybody was thinking that, you know, Kyle Shanahan would go Kyle Pitts at number three instead of quarterback. 
But um, just kind of once again, he, he can't rely on the availability, and the availability is big. One year, we can kind of, you know, write it off. All right, it was a fluke season. Carson Wentz's first injury. All righty, that's fluke. Jimmy Garoppolo's first injury, which was by himself tearing it. What, he tore his ACL because he was trying to juke on the sideline. Unfortunate and a meaningless play to pick up meaningless five extra yards. Unfortunate, that's how he gets injured. So, all right, we can write those injuries off. No worries. Let's come back next year. We can kind of piece everything together together for this remaining season but next year we need you there big time and then you get injured again and it's like all righty well I'm not going to have my coaching record uh, uh, you know affected by your talent your injuries I'm not going to have that you know unfortunately this is a team game but it's also a little bit of individual business here if I'm not producing as the coach they're going to get rid of me if you're not producing or available as the quarterback I'm going to get rid of you we're all trying to save face as well as making the team work and I'm not going to sink down while you're sinking I'm abandoning ship it's unfortunate but, hey, I'm looking out for myself a little bit as I'm trying to make this team work overall. So, just a little insight there uh, between Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay. Great, absolute stacked division. It will always probably be the best division in football for the next at least three, four seasons as long as these head coaches and great quarterbacks emerging up in this league. Um, so, watch out for the NFC West. It's absolutely great. Seahawks, Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson, Rams, Sean McVay, Matt Stafford, Cardinals, Cliff Kingsbury, and Kyler Murray, and the 49ers with Kyle Shanahan and potentially who they pick up. <laughs> who was their quarterback? Um, um, Justin Fields. No. They got Trey Lance. Yeah, I can't believe they got Trey Lance. Why would you go out and get Trey Lance? That's right. Yeah, that's right, right? Trey Lance? Yeah, I don't I don't like Trey Lance at all. I mean, the one big knock I have on Trey Lance is the man played, you know, in um the FCS and he had a great 2019 season, but when we looked at that COVID season, the one game they played before the season got canceled, the man threw a pick. <laughs> the man threw no touchdowns in a pick. He threw no picks in 2019. So you're in a worse kind of overall football division. And then you just threw a pick. So did you just have one good year? We like Justin Fields 100% over 100% over Trey Lance. But we'll see. We'll see how he pans out. Kyle Shanahan's kind of big on him. So I guess we have to kind of, you know, respect his choice and respect his mind. Everybody's bragging about him. He's pretty solid. So hopefully he's got the right guy there. Alrighty, let's move on here. Let's check the price of these cards real quickly. They are still in stock, and they dropped down to 383. It's still too high for us, folks. Still, still way too high. We're looking for 200. <laughs> Screw that 383 noise. No, thank you. All right, let's go back to a story here. Here we go. <clears throat> Jaguars rookie Travis Etienne has Trevor Lawrence's help in attempting to learn receiver position so we kind of you know talked about this early on in the uh the OTAs when Urban Meyer is like I'm not having Travis Etienne run any um, running plays he's only playing receiver here for the OTAs and we were like okay we don't really like that and once again kind of Urban Meyer his first real decisions are not having Travis Etienne play the running back position early in those training camps and signing Tim Tebow these are his big first moves, folks. I can't get behind any of them. So, and also, when we kind of look back, you know, Travis Etienne and Trevor Lawrence, they both played at Clemson together. When we look at what Travis Etienne did, folks, I mean, the man rushed for 1,600 yards back-to-back. Back-to-back -back. Back -back in 2018, 2019. Fantastic. He ran for 900 yards in uh, 2020, but he didn't have as many carries. Um, he averaged 5.4 yards a carry. I mean, folks, when he was rushing for 1,600 yards, he was averaging 8.1 and 7.8 yards a carry. Uh, that is absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> absolutely fantastic. So the fact that Urban Meyer wants to just kind of, you know, transform him into a dual threat kind of Alva Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, I you know, it does work in this league. But if you've got, you know, a home run hitter at the running back position, then just let him do that. He only caught his best uh, receiving season was his last season for 588 yards. 
He caught 432 yards with 1,600 yards rushing. That's an absolutely phenomenal season. Jeez Louise, 2019, folks. 2,000 yards total, 1,600 rushing, 400 receiving. So it's still decent. We know Christian McCaffrey, a dual threat, 1,000, 1,000. 1,000 yards rushing, 1,000 yards receiving. And Alvin Kamara is about 900 rushing. He's never broken that 1,000-yard mark. And I think he's more like 600 yards receiving. So once again, not bad, but if we could put up 1,600 on the ground, I'm going to take that, shoot. And the fact that Trevor Lawrence and him never truly, they got it going decent. They had 900 yards, uh, you know, Travis Etienne had 900 yards receiving during his last two seasons combined. But when we look at kind of Trevor Lance's throwing stats, I mean, he's only throwing for 3,000 yards, folks. 3,200 year one, 3,600 year two, 3,100 year three. So it's not like Trevor Lawrence is kind of, you know, getting it to him in college. And that would have been the perfect time to see what they could do. Trevor Lawrence throwing the ball to Travis Etienne because it's college and you can just easily beat the defenders. So they weren't truly getting it done in college and now they're trying to bring it to this NFL system where we know the NFL, the defenses are absolutely way better, a thousand percent way better than they are in college. So it's just like, we're not truly understanding. We we, we we get the strategy because it does work in this league. It doesn't work that much. There's only two players that are dual threat rushers and receivers in this league. And it's Christian McCaffrey and Alvin Kamara. The other ones can kind of go for about two, three hundred. That's kind of, you know, average-ish just the check downs on the running back positions. So, you know, these aren't these kind of, you know, game changer, dual threat running backs. There's only two in the league, folks. So... Urban Meyer coming in year one, first time coaching this league, has a rookie quarterback that we do think should be good, has a rookie running back that we do think should be good, but this is kind of your big plans. I think it's a little too ambitious. We'll see how it turns out, but let's see what we get here in this article. Any quotes here by Travis Etienne and how they're getting it done here. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> rookie running back Travis Etienne spent all three days of the minicamp talk. Talk, taking his reps at receiver. So once again, like we, we, we've covered this story before, folks, earlier in the year. And now we're kind of getting, you know, Travis Etienne's thoughts on it after all that has taken place. So we'll see what he says. But rookie running back Travis Etienne spent all three days of May minicamp taking his reps at receiver instead of his usual backfield alignment. On the surface, the approach was initially initially peculiar. Why introduce a rookie runner to his first NFL reps at a completely new position? But new coach... Urban Meyer boiled it down to a simple explanation. Oh, I'm glad you can just boil everything complicated down to something simple. Let's see. Either ETN was going to improve as a pass catching back, or he was just starting to become a hybrid type who could be a weapon on all downs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, once again, if you boil it down like that, it's it's good. But when you look at the NFL landscape, it's hard to say, that's harder that's harder said than done. No? Like we said, there's two hybrids in this league, folks. Christian McCaffrey and Alvin Kamara. That's it. That's it. As expected, the results of July are inconclusive. So once again, it's like you had him do it, but we still don't even know. So once again, what was the point of it? We understand, you know, it's just OTAs, mandatory minicamps are, you know, three, five days, nothing big. We get that, folks. You know, training camp, you know, this is when everything truly starts to get solidified. So we get all that. Um, but ETN is doing more than what's expected of him. And luckily for him, he has a familiar face and former Clemson teammate and fellow 2021 draft selection Trevor Lawrence to help him improve his craft. Quote, <clears throat> Now I am just like kind of learning real receiver routes and having Trey out here to just or Trev out here just to do simple things as run routes outside and just kind of go over it by ourselves. It has really been great for me and really helped me just speed up that process. All right. Yeah. You know, once again, that familiar face is always great. That's kind of why, you know, we're happy that kind of Tua has a familiar face. He's got Jalen Waddle. So once again, we can kind of expect, you know, some solid work there by those two. They've got chemistry. They have history. They've won together. They kind of know how to, how to get it done. Um, that's the only quote that we get. Okay. So that is the only quote we get real simple there. So 
All right, I guess we don't have really anything else to kind of sink our teeth into on this article. So we'll see how it pans out, Urban. You know, it's it's sink or swim, man. You know, you don't get that much time to kind of prove that you can get it done. You get year one. You can do whatever you want year one. Succeed, fail. We really can't knock you too much. Um, year two, we've got to start seeing improvement. Really have to start start seeing wins, good wins, good quality, seven, eight, nine wins. And then year three, if you're not getting it done, we're starting to kind of look for your replacement. So Urban Meyer having his plan here. He thinks this is how to get it done. He was successful in college. We'll see how he, do, how he does in the NFL. All righty. <clears throat> Let's go to the next story up. And here we go. And once again, kind of, you know, going back to stuff we've been talking about. And once again, this is why we do the show every day. This is why we talk about stories every single day and maybe kind of same stories, same kind of similar stories, just with new information, new quotes, new this, new that. This is why we talk everything every day, folks, so we can kind of see where the narrative started, explore all the options, and then start seeing where the narrative is still shifting. Explore all those options, compare that, this narrative now to the narrative one week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago, a year ago, and then we repeat the process all over again, folks. So this is what we do here on the show. This is why we're here every day, baby. No weekends off, no days off. Weekend? Weekend? No, we've got stuff to talk about. You can still find good stories on the weekend, folks. This is what we do here. So, let's go to this narrative. Once again, remember Tom Brady in the barbershop? Hey, this motherfucker, you're keeping that motherfucker over me? <laughs> laughable, laughable. We've talked that through. We've explored all those possibilities of who Tom Brady was motherfuckering. Our kind of final one that we truly came down to was Mitch Trubisky. That's really kind of the only quarterback. Maybe Jared Goff was up there as well. Potentially, that was kind of the two that we were kind of firmly on. It was either Mitch Trubisky, potentially Jared Goff, of who Tom Brady was motherfuckering. We'll never know because he doesn't come out and say it. Unfortunate. But then a couple days later, when the media was talking about the story, they said it was Derek Carr. That he was motherfuckering Derek Carr. And once again, we came back and we, we talked it through. We've got the video up, a seven-minute clip. It's titled, Was Tom Brady Motherfuckering Derek Carr? Question mark. And we never bought into that. Everybody was like, oh, yeah, it was Derek Carr. Oh, yeah, it was Derek Carr. I'm hearing it's Derek Carr. I'm hearing it was the Raiders. I'm hearing it was Derek Carr. And then we kind of thought it through, and it just never made sense to us, folks. We looked at his stats. The man's stats was great. He was getting solid wins. And, you know, just to have, you know, Derek Carr, he's a real solid quarterback in this league. I think he can get it done. He can get you to the Super Bowl. Can he win the Super Bowl? I don't know, but he can get you there, and that's step one of winning the Super Bowl, getting there, and I think Derek Carr is a quarterback that can get you to the Super Bowl. We have to look at the coaches that he's been having. He's been having John Gruden. Folks, if we're putting any blame here on the Raiders between Derek Carr and John Gruden, I think I'm, I'm weighing the blame more on John Gruden because we've seen him not get it done as a head coach until he kind of has everything perfect set up for him. So we looked at Derek Carr's stats. They're fantastic. He doesn't really turn the ball over. He has multiple 4,000-yard seasons. And I don't. we don't think, we truly don't think at all, we gave, no, we gave no credence to that narrative that Tom Brady was motherfuckering Derek Carr. We talked it through. We looked at the stats. We didn't think that was right. And now we get this. Derek Carr says Tom wasn't talking about him on the shop. So, quote here by Derek Carr, when asked about, you know, if Tom Brady was motherfuckering him. He says, if it was, I've gotten in enough trouble saying to challenge some people to fights. So, Derek Carr's a fighter out here. He wants, he wants to smoke out here. Once again, you're not motherfuckering somebody that wants to smoke, honestly. Um, but as a man, Tom, I know you got the rings, but if it's not me, then we're good. What I heard, it wasn't me. So once again, Derek Carr's inner circle is saying, hey, no, he wasn't talking about you, which he's been hearing, hey, it's never him, it wasn't him, and we just don't think it would have been him anyway. First of all, we don't think Tom Brady wanted to go to the Raiders anyway. I don't think, we truly don't think Tom Brady respects John Gruden as head coach. I don't think Tom Brady, You're once again, if you're coming off of Bill Belichick, you're going to choose another team that has a great head coach, a la why he chose Bruce Arians. He's a great coach in this league. 
So just kind of the head coaching aspect, he doesn't want to go play with John Gruden, folks. No way, no way. In the way that Derek Carr plays, it's serviceable, folks. I, I will I will say that. There's a lot of Derek Carr hate out there. We will explore that possibility, you know, once basketball season concludes and we have a lot more free time on the show and, you know, we can kind of reset all of our narratives. Are we right? Are we wrong? We're watching everybody. We're looking at everybody. We're reviewing the entire last season. So we're all on the same page come this season. We are going to get to that, and we will look at Derek Carr. Can the man play? Because the stats are looking real great. How is he throwing the ball? How is he getting those stats? We will dive in deeper, but for my recollection, he's got a great arm. He's got a great arm, big arm, solid arm, accurate arm. I mean, folks, he's throwing 60% every single season. His completion percentage was another thing, another factor of why we don't think Tom Brady was motherfuckering him. And if you're telling me that if we're given two quarterbacks – Mitch Trubisky and Derek Carr, and you're telling me that Tom Brady was motherfuckering Derek Carr over Mitch Trubisky? I don't believe that at all, folks. Zero percent. So once again, folks, this is what we do on the show. We look at all the narratives. We look at what people are saying. And when we don't agree, we're going to call it out. We've got no problem doing so. We get flack all the time. I don't care. I all think I care. I'm talking. I'm still talking. Year. I've been here a year. Year. Y'all are not going to deter me from not talking anymore. But, um, yeah, I just don't think it's Derek Carr. Derek Carr himself says, hey, it's really not me. This is what I'm hearing. And, you know, just that kind of came out of left field, folks. That truly caught me off guard when the na- when the media was running. Uh, like, everybody was saying, oh, it's Derek Carr. Oh, it's Derek Carr. Oh, it's Derek Carr. We were like, why? Why would it be Derek Carr? That makes no sense to us when you got Mitch Trubisky sitting in the corner. Everybody likes to not talk about Mitch Trubisky. What's that about? The man's the worst quarterback I've ever seen. <laughs> The man's the worst quarterback I've ever seen, folks. So, do we say we were right? Another rightness for takes by fans? Jeez, Louise, all these rights. I mean, gosh darn. And we're still disrespected. I'll never understand it, but I guess, whatever. <laughs> Y'all do you. Uh, so, Derek Carr says it wasn't him. He says that Tom Brady wasn't motherfuckering him. And we agreed. We never thought it. All right, let's move on here. Uh, talking about the Steelers running back in this... Uh, this one, okay, all right, well, we'll, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but mm, meh, meh. here we go, Steelers running back, Benny Snell, Benny Snell, Steelers running back, Benny Snell, on fighting on for roster spot, quote, I never have settled and been comfortable, okay, the only reason why we were going to talk about this story is because if you're a running back on the Steelers, you might as well not even try <laughs> You might as well not even try. You got Najee Harris in front of you. You'll never see the field. But let's see what Benny Snell is saying here. He's fighting for a roster spot. Want to be kind of number two behind Najee Harris. We are big, big, big on Najee Harris. We think he's going to hit the ground running. And we think he's going to have – he'll he'll set he'll set the, the single season rushing record. He will do that year one rookie year and cement himself as the greatest running back of all time. And Derrick Henry will have to get on his horse to try to beat that. They'll, they'll be going back and forth, folks. Derrick Henry and Najee Harris. You can quote me on this. I don't care. Najee Harris and Trev, um, Najee Harris and Derrick Henry will be each setting the single season rush record from here on out. From here for the next 10 years, it will be Na- Najee Harris one year, Derrick Henry the other, Najee Harris, Derrick Henry, all leapfrogging them, and then somebody's going to end up with 3,000 yards rushing. Something so absurd. But one of these running backs will do so, folks. You can quote me on this. I do not care. This is my take. I will die on this take. So let's see what Benny Snell is saying here on this tough, 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 running back room because Najee Harris is there. All right, here we go. The Steelers. um, All right, let's start at the top. We got to start at the top here. Here we go. The Pittsburgh Steelers reworked their running back room in 2021, saying goodbye to James Conner, thank goodness, in drafting Najee Harris in the first round. The Steelers also signed Kellen Balazs and Benny Snell, Snell and Jalen Samuels, and Trey Edmonds, and a 2024th round pick, Anthony McFarland. So they do have a crowded room, but we all know who the leader is. There is no way any any of these uh, of these running backs, Kellen Balazs, Benny Snell, Jalen Samuels, or Trey Edmonds will ever try and touch running back one, Najee Harris. The crowded room with Nar- with Harris at the top should set off a battle for backup roster spots. Yes, I'm glad that everybody's on the same page. We are all battling for backup spots. Number two, number three. 
uh, during training camp. With Snell and Balazs playing a similar reserve between the tackles role, there should be a battle to make the final 53-man roster. Snell was asked about the projection during an appearance on Kentucky Sports Radio. The 23-year-old responded that he could only put his best foot forward and let his play do the talking. Quote, Honestly, I can say I'm taking it as part of my journey. I never have settled and been comfortable. You know that. This is my job now, you know. Another thing I keep in mind was the Steelers picked me. I didn't pick the Steelers, so I'm ride and dying about where I'm at. When it comes time to work, it's time to work. I feel like even on top of us having Najee, you can't just do one back for the whole season and hustle. No, you can. Najee Harris can. Najee Harris and Derrick Henry are the only two backs that you can have only one running back on your team and still win the Super Bowl. That's it. Don't undermine this man. Benny. Benny Snell. I feel like even on top of having Najee, you can't just do one back for the whole season and hustle. I definitely know that roads and big time moments are going to come up and I'm going to make sure I'm ready for them. I'm just keeping my head down and working. All right, we can respect that. Um, you know, hey, we're all just fighting for running back number two here. Kellen Balaj, Benny Snell, Trey Edmonds. You're going to have to go and get that work because like we said, I mean, one roster spot's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. It's gone. It's off the table. Now there's maybe two, two running back spots left. Maybe three if we're going to keep four. We probably won't because Najee Harris is so gosh darn good. He'll play one and two. So the two goes to three and the three goes to the four. Um, is that right? Did I do that right? You keep three. Najee Harris can play two. And then the other two just go to three and four, even though there's only three. Najee Harris is two, folks. <laughs> he, he's, he's two runners. Uh, he's two spots on the roster. He's so gosh darn good. All right, so let's uh, let's give Benny Snell the benefit of the doubt here. Let's look up his stats. Obviously, no big name here, but let's see what he's been doing, where he's been at. We'll give him some benefit of the doubt here, shouting him out. All right, so he's been in Pittsburgh, uh, 2019, 426 yards. Last season, 368 yards. So once again, it's like if you weren't beating out James Conner for the job – uh, obviously, we've got some solid yards here. These are solid backup yards. All right-ish. 400 yards, 300 yards. Not bad. What did he do? Catching out of the backfield. He does not catch out of the backfield. Okay. 23 yards receiving year one. 61 yards receiving year two. That's nothing great. So you're not catching the ball out of the backfield. You're not having kind of a second component to your game. It's going to be a little hard to kind of, you know, challenge. You know, we don't. We know Najee Harris is a decent catcher. He can get it done. He's a better runner than a catcher, obviously. He's not going to come out and be Alvin Kamara or kind of Christian McCaffrey in the dual threat. But, you know, he'll be, you know, the, the kind of an average, above average pass catcher out there. So, Benny Snell kind of working, you know, against him a little bit that he's not kind of this elite pass catcher out of the backfield. But, uh, you know, we got July training camp coming up at the, at the end of this month, and we'll see which running backs emerge as two and three because we all know running back one, signed, sealed, delivered. All righty, here we go. This, uh, this little race appeared on our timeline, and I'm very glad it did. We can always praise, always praise Tyreek Mother Love and Hill. He is the best receiver in the league. Once again, I will live and die by this take. Right now, he is the best receiver in this league. It's him. So, he raced Aaron Jones yesterday. And folks, folks, talk about a blowout. A short little maybe 40-yard dash. And not in... Uh, uh, Tyreek Hill just absolutely obliterates this man. I mean, this man's a full three yards ahead of him. Tyreek Hill is a full three yards ahead of Aaron Jones at the end of the race. Here we go. I'm, I'm going to take this as the finish line right here because Tyreek Hill even kind of lets up a little bit. So this is a solid three yards, folks. You know how much separation three yards is in the NFL? It's huge, folks. It's huge. This is three steps ahead. We, we talk about, you know, being a step ahead of half a step ahead. This man is three steps ahead of him. So if we could kind of highlight Tyreek Hill, we will always do that on the show. I would have no problem taking the entire show an hour and a half to talk about Tyreek Hill. He is the best receiver in the league. Let's get his official height up. I believe he's 5'8". 
which is just stupid. Maybe maybe not that small. Maybe 5'10". Uh, I don't think... No, he's not that tall. He's not 5'10". Uh, but let's see what Tyreek Hill is officially. 5'10". Okay, he is 5'10". Uh, but small receiver who plays like he's 6 for folks. 1,000 yards last season. 1,400 yards in 2018. 1,100 yards in 2017. 2019, a little bit of a down year because he only played 12 games. And he was still able to rack up 800 yards. 800 yards in 12 games. What was he averaging at yards per game? 71 yards per game. So if you add that times 4, folks, he's well over 1,000. So he's absolutely spectacular. The man had 15 touchdowns last year, 64% catch percentage last year. Yes, sir, folks. This is the perfect weapon for Patrick Mahomes. Just throw it 50 yards as soon as the ball is snapped, and Tyreek Hill will be 50 yards down the field in two seconds flat to catch that wide open ball because nobody can kind of keep up pace with him. So absolutely love Tyreek Hill, folks. Y'all know this. Y'all know this. Alrighty. Uh, the card prices are starting to slow down a little bit. 366. Dang it. Dang it. We got to get down to 200, folks. Darn. Can't buy these now. Got to wait a little bit longer. So let's keep up with another story here. All right, let's go to these now. So uh, the NFL is kind of tweeting out. I believe they're doing one a day because uh, we, we just saw this uh, two days ago. And we didn't do it on the show yesterday because we ran out of time. We were going pretty long. Um, but we've got, um, they, they tweet these out. Here we go. Choose your all-star AFC offense. So they do this, or AFC East offense. So they do this division by division. Seems to be one division a day. So we can kind of go through these over the next kind of, you know, week, couple of days here. We got to make up for yesterday's. Um, today they tweeted out the, oh no, this was yesterday. Are we one behind? Maybe they haven't tweeted theirs of today yet. Uh, but, um, so... Choose your all-star offense of the AFC East, and then we also have the AFC North as well. So the, you choose one quarterback, one running back, one wide receiver, and one tight end from a team in that division. So let's start here with the AFC East and build our all-star offense of the AFC East. So the Bills, Dolphins, Jets, Patriots, AFC East. Let's start here with the quarterbacks. Josh Allen, Tua, Zach Wilson, Cam Newton. Those are our quarterbacks to choose from, and we got to go with Josh Allen, folks. I mean, folks, I just cannot brag about this man enough. The leap that he made from year one and two to year three is absolutely spectacular. This is how it is done in this league. This is kind of the natural progression. Yes, we have outliers of, you know, Lamar Jackson, who came out really just firing year one. Patrick Holmes, you know, a year sitting on the bench and then firing out year one, his official year one. But the natural progression is kind of not the greatest year one. Should make a little decent stride year two. Josh Allen really didn't do that. But then year three is the put up or shut up. You must be great to year three. And that's what Josh Allen was. So I'm giving a ton of credit to Josh Allen. And he will be our quarterback over to uh, Zach Wilson's unproven. And Cam Newton is just really just kind of below average. Even though he's been in the league for eight plus years. To uh, we believe in them, but I mean, I folks, I just can't brag enough. I cannot gush enough over what Josh Allen did year three. Absolutely fantastic, sixty nine percent completion. Give me that. I give me that. Give me that right now. I will take that. Uh, so Josh Allen is our quarterback. Now we look at running back. Mm, not the greatest here. We got Devin Singletary, Miles Gaskin, Tevin Coleman, and Damian Harris. Well, all these running backs are very not good, folks. I guess I take Devin Singletary. I guess. I mean, folks, these running backs here, Tevin Coleman, Damian Harris, Miles Gaskin, the even Devin Singletary isn't good. I mean, folks, these are all kind of, you know, like back 20, back 20 running backs in the league. So I guess I'll just take Devin Singletary. Now we go to wide receiver, Stefan Diggs, Jalen Waddell, Corey Davis, Nelson Aguilar. All righty, this one is real tough, folks. This one is real tough. The wide receivers are definitely way better than the running backs here in the AFC East. Stephon Diggs is absolutely great. Um, Jalen Waddell, great in college, not proven here in the NFL. He should be great. Corey Davis, absolutely fantastic with that Titans team. 
Big, tall, wide receiver. Y'all know I love that. And then we got Nelson Aguilar. Um, if I'm ranking them, I have to put Jalen Wilder number four just because he's unproven, unfortunately. I put Nelson Aguilar three. And I'm going to go Stephon Diggs too. And I'm taking Corey Davis. I'm taking the height, baby. Give me the big, tall, wide receiver who will catch it down the field. Stephon Diggs is great in the kind of the slant game, the comeback routes, the quick off his feet. But I'm going to go the deep ball with Corey Davis that can win kind of the 50-50 jump ball. And then we get the tight ends. We get Dawson Knox, Mike Gesicki, Chris Herndon, and Hunter Henry. And this is where I'm going to go with the fans, baby. Mike Gesicki. Once again, this is one of these premier tight ends that should be emerging here. Young guns. He just attended tight end university. And this man, he's got glimpses of his game like he plays like Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. He can run the route, but this man also has ball skills like the wide receiver. This man was tripled and uh, this man was triple coverage down the field and he was still able to come up with the ball. He'll sacrifice his body going over the middle, diving for the ball. Mike Kosicki, watch for the name this year. We absolutely love it. So our all-star AFC offense is Josh Allen, Devin Singletary, Corey Davis, and Mike Kosicki. Love it. All right, now let's go to the AFC North here. All-star offense of the AFC North. We got the Bengals, the Browns, the Ravens, and the Steelers, baby. So let's start here with the quarterback. We got Joe Burrow, Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, or Big Ben Roethlisberger. All righty. We're not going to take Big Ben because he's aging out of this league. Unfortunate. Uh, he can't play an entire season throwing the ball down the field. We're not going to take Joe Burrow. How is he going to come back from the injury? A little bit of a question mark. Baker Mayfield, real solid but not really elite. We see his stats and they're good. These are good, solid stats. These are not elite stats. These are game manager stats. So we're going to take Lamar Jackson, folks. He's a dual threat quarterback, great legs, and we do believe he has a great deep ball. He just needs some wide receivers to help him out a little bit. Once again, you just cannot be. A, you just can't have a good quarterback in this league, folks. You do need a little bit of help, and the Ravens truly had no help. The, the, the receivers were all small last season. So I'm taking Lamar Jackson as the quarterback. Now we got running back. We got Joe Mixon, Nick Chubb, J.K. Dobbins, or Najee Harris. And I am in a pickle here, folks. I am in a big old pickle. I'm not taking Joe Mixon, and I'm not taking J.K. Dobbins. Nick Chubb is fantastic, but Najee Harris, folks. Ugh. Do I go with proven or soon to be definite proven running back in this league in Najee Harris? That is where we had the dilemma. But I'm going to go, I'm going to give the respect to Nick Chubb. I'm going to respect Nick Chubb here and take Nick Chubb. I love Najee Harris. I'll gush about him all day long, but I have to see him week one. After after his first rush, then we can start believing in Najee Harris 100%. But I got to see the first rush in the NFL first. That's it. So I'm taking Lamar Jackson at quarterback, Nick Chubb at running back. Now we got the wide receivers. We got Jamar Chase, OBJ, Hollywood Brown, and Juju Smith-Schuster. Well, I'm not taking Hollywood Brown with Lamar Jackson. They're good. They're speedsters. But this man cannot catch any ball down 20 yards. It's unfortunate. Odell Beckham, I reach back like 1-3, like 1-3. Yes, sir. This man's absolutely great at catching the ball. Jamar Chase just once again, just a little unproven in this league. And I don't think he's kind of even the top of the crop here at wide receivers in this draft. I'm taking Devontae Smith, and I'm taking Jalen Waddell over Jamar Chase. Sue me. He, he didn't play. He opted out of the 2020 season. Unfortunate. Haven't seen him play in it in a year. One hit wonder? Maybe. Most likely not, but also potentially. So I can't give it to the, uh, Jamar Chase. And then we get Juju Smith-Schuster. Um, he's been reliable here, but the dancing on the sideline, uh, dancing on the logo, just kind of that not kind of football IQ I need of just kind of overall sports IQ as well of, hey, don't give any unnecessary motivation to the opposing team before the game has even started. So I'm going to go with OBJ. And now we get the tight end position. And I love that they add the tight ends here. Once again, we are big on tight ends this year, folks. Tight end university, that is their new nickname. We are now... Takes by Tight End University. That's our new name of the show. Uh, but here we go with the tight ends. We got Drew Sample, Austin Hooper, Mark Andrews, or Eric Ebron. All right, real solid here. These are all kind of tier two tight ends. No elite Darren Waller, no elite George Kittle, no elite Travis Kelsey just quite yet. Mark Andrews is real freaking solid. Austin Hooper is real great. What did Austin Hooper do last year? Did he have above 500? Because I think I'm choosing either Austin Hooper or... Mark Andrews, Austin Hooper had 435 yards. He's maxed out at 787 for his career. And what does Mark Andrews do? I don't think Mark Andrews has that high of a receiving season, unfortunately. 
Uh, 700 yards last season, 800 yards, 2019. Yeah, okay, I was wrong about that. Yeah, I am taking Mark Andrews 100% there. Give me Mark Andrews as the tight end position. So our all-star offense is Lamar Jackson, Nick Chubb, OBJ, and Mark Andrews. Only using the Browns and only using the Ravens. Very close to using the Steelers for their running back. All righty, that... Our, those are all the stories that we needed to cover for today. So let's head over to the NBA and kind of talk over game two of the NBA Finals, tipping off at 9 o'clock tonight on ABC. Suns won game one, 118-105, folks. Real great game. We had a great game from Chris Paul, his best game of the season. Honestly, pretty much right there. Fantastic. 32 points, 9 rebounds. Devin Booker, just solid 27 points. And then DeAndre in 22 points and 19 rebounds. Absolutely phenomenal. Now, the Suns still won, and Jay Crowder had a real lackluster game. He shot Ove. Ove, that's lackluster as you can get, folks. One point, Ove from the field. Split his free throws. Got to the line twice and split those. So he was trash. He was truly trash. He was good defensively, trash offensively. And the Suns were still able to get great offensive production by everybody else and put up 118 points. That is a huge silver lining for the Suns team. Because Jay Crowder, if he can get three threes in a game, folks, take take that kind of um, motivation that they have and just extend it. That kind of home court, if a, if the if the Bucks go on a run and Jay Crowder's hitting a three, drain all that momentum. So, like we said, putting up 118 points with Jay Crowder shooting 0 of 8 from the field, that's huge, folks. That is big deal here. All right, what happened with the Bucks in game one? We got, um, you know, Brooke Lopez kind of getting... Bitch, big time. Chris Paul shooting over him and just kind of DeAndre and taking him to the cleaners a little bit. Giannis had a real great game. He was the only kind of silver lining here in this Bucks team. He was a plus one at 20 points, 17 rebounds, and he played 35 minutes. So he is going to play game two, no doubt, but we need Chris Middleton to be a little bit more efficient. He was solid, 29 points on 46% shooting. He actually wasn't bad. We do definitely need just Drew Holiday to be a little bit more efficient. But once again, you know, Chris Paul locking him up a little bit. We've only seen Drew Holiday kind of get it done against kind of subpar point guards. Didn't get it done against the Nets when James Harden was just kind of standing around at the three-point arc coming back from the injury. And, you know, after Trey Young went down, then he finally was able to get it going a little bit more. So, once again, Drew Holiday, we need a big game from him for the Bucks to win game two. All right, let's get this spread up. Uh, hopefully, we can finally bet this on um, DraftKings. Here we go. Is the spread here? Here we go. Finally. All right. So, here we go. Bucks plus five, Suns minus five. So, let's compare the spread back to game one. When Giannis was a game time decision, really more leaning towards he was not playing. It was Bucks plus six. When Giannis was playing right before the game started, when he got announced that he was going to give it a go, the spread went to Bucks plus four and a half. So now it's kind of right in that sweet spot of the two at Bucks plus five. Let's see the ins and out here. All right, here we go. Ins and outs for game number two tonight. Here we go. Uh, everybody's going to go for the Bucs. Giannis is not a game-time decision. He is definitely playing like we knew. And then for the Suns, oh, we forgot to talk about this the other day. How unfortunate. Dario Sharik tore his ACL game one. He was in for like five minutes. I don't even think five minutes. How many minutes did he play? I think he just got in and like the first, first play he tore his ACL. How unfortunate. Uh, Dario Sharik, what do we got? Two minutes and 24 seconds played. True. I mean, I'm not making a joke. I mean, it's unfortunate, truly. Um... So Frank Kaminsky comes in, and we are decently big on Frank Kaminsky. He only played three minutes, though. So I, we would like more minutes by Frank Kaminsky. Frank Kaminsky was in during those two regular season, at least one. Was he in in both? At least one of those regular season games, Frank Kaminsky was in the starting lineup uh, for the suns Bucks in the regular season. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, big here. Obviously... You know, DeAndre Ayton's better than both of them. We know them. He's just a reliever out there. But we do believe in Frank Kaminsky. We don't think that's going to hurt the Suns team overall too much, honestly. I do like Frank Kaminsky. Do I like him better than Dario Sherrick? It's it's tough. I don't really think one has anything better. What is Dario Sherrick averaging this season? Let's see this. Let's get some numbers to this. So he's averaging eight points and three rebounds a game. 
And let's see what um, Frank Kaminsky is averaging. Darius Sherrick has kind of been, you know, lighting it up from three. And Frank Kaminsky is averaging six points and four rebounds. So, you know, it's pretty it's pretty similar out here, honestly. It's nothing, you know, one has over the other. Um, what's his – I want to know what Darius Sherrick's three-point percentage is. I would like to see this. Because I think that's what Darius Sherrick has over Frank Kaminsky is a little bit of a better three-pointer. Um, but let's see what he's shooting. Three-point percentage this season. He's shooting 44% from three. That's absolutely fantastic, especially for a big man. He's, like, taking, like, one, point, one three a game. So it's nothing big. He's not taking, like, five threes a game. But still shooting 44% is real good. And I don't think Frank Kaminsky even attempts threes like this. Uh, let's see what he's averaging from the three. Um, yeah, I mean, he's not even... Pfft, yeah, he's not even taking a three a game. He's taking 0.7 threes a game, folks. Obviously, none. And he's shooting 20%. So that's kind of the difference here between Frank Kaminsky and Dario Sherrick. Just a three-point attempt. So once again, I don't think that's going to hurt the Suns overall here in the series. We do still believe in Frank Kaminsky. All right, but back to the spread here. Bucks plus five, Suns minus five. All righty. So we took Bucks plus six, game one, and that obviously turned out to be a real big dumpster. Why did it turn out to be a real big dumpster? Was because Chris Paul absolutely went manic. 37 points, absolutely, or 32 points, decided whatever person he wanted to get on, and he drained the shot over. Now, why do we like the Bucks plus five tonight in game two a little bit? Well, because we kind of saw the same thing happen with the Bucks versus the Hawks. Trey Young went manic. He was picking on Brooke Lopez. He was allowing whatever he wanted to do. Let's get up game one. Let's get up game one um, Hawks series here. Uh, how do I want to look this up? We can go uh, like this. Let's go like this, folks. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Bucks Hawks game one. Hawks win one sixteen one thirteen, and I believe they kind of the Bucks came back big in the fourth quarter a little bit. Uh, here we go. The quarter is scoring by quarter. Hawks uh, down twenty five to twenty eight. Uh, Hawks down in the second quarter, 29 to 31. And then they have the big third quarter, 34 to 26. And then they both tied up in the fourth quarter. So a little bit different than my original thinking there. I thought Hawks just were kind of good from the rip, uh, big good from the rip, but you know, real close. I mean, they were only down, um, five points at halftime and then blew them out by, uh, by eight in the third quarter. Not eight. Yeah. Eight, eight. All right. Uh, but, um, let's look what Trey Young did folks. Trey Young, 48 points. Chris Paul, 32 points. So once again, the point guards truly getting it done. And the big thing, once again, was that Brooke Lopez was just getting absolutely killed, folks. Brooke Lopez, minus 14 on the floor. The worst by far, folks. And he only played 20 minutes. So once again, Brooke Lopez, game one of the Sun Series. He was a minus 17 on the floor, and he only played 22 minutes. So once again, it kind of lined up exactly what happened during the Hawks series. And what did Mike Boonhauser do for game two? Made a little bit of an adjustment. Let's go to see what happened game two in the Bucks hawks Eastern Conference Final Series, the Bucks blow out the Hawks on the or at home. They're at home for this game, winning 125-91. Big old blowout there. Now, what did Trey Young have? Game number two, 15 points, and Trey Young was a minus 29 on the floor. And what did Brooke Lopez have? 16 points and plus 31 on the floor. He also only played 23 minutes. But they were able to defend the high pick and roll. Mike Boonhauser brought in kind of, uh, who did he bring in a little bit more off the bench? Uh, was this Pat Connaughton going for 13 minutes? Bobby Portis going for 17 minutes as well? What did, um, what did Bobby Portis do in game one? How many minutes did he play? Bobby Portis played 14 minutes in game number 
one. So once again, giving more minutes to Brooke Lopez, giving more minutes to uh, Bobby Portis, figuring out the high pick and roll that Clint Capella and Trey Young were running, and Trey Young able to pick this offense apart in game one, and they shut it down in game two. Now, Mike Boonhauser's his legacy is on the line this series, folks. His finals, he needs to be a smart, great head coach. We need to see that proven by him. He kind of did it in spurts in this Hawk series, but once again, him kind of not making any adjustments in game one, he kind of resorted to kind of, you know, classic national spotlight Mike Bootenhauser of, you know, he's a garbage head coach. So, I am going to take the Bucks plus five tonight. Can Chris Paul duplicate that performance? Or is Mike Boonhauser going to shut it down? Are they not going to switch on everything? Is Chris Paul not going to be able to pick apart Brooke Lopez? Is Brooke Lopez just getting his feet under him in the series like he had to do in game one where Trey Young picked him apart? So, I'm going to kind of ride what the Bucks have been doing a little bit. We let you win game one, maybe even game two, but we're constantly learning, evolving, and learning what it's going to take to come out and beat you. And I'm going to give this Bucks team the benefit of the doubt tonight to say that they come back with a great game plan and come out and be competitive and try to win game two on the road here to try to not go down 0-2 heading back to Milwaukee where now it's do or die. So I'm going to take the Bucks plus five here. I'm going to give a lot of stake. I'm trusting Mike Bootenhauser here. You better pay off. I'm trusting Brooke Lopez. Once again, you better pay off. And I'm, I'm going to have to have a little bit more faith in... Drew Holiday as well, who pretty much had, is this the worst game? Is this his worst game of the entire playoffs? Let's get his stats up real quickly. His just overall playoff stats. To see, was this Drew Holiday's worst game that he played in the entire playoffs? Because it potentially could have been. 10 points on awful shooting. He shot, what, 30? 28%. Absolutely abysmal. Absolutely abysmal. So let's get up Drew Holiday's stats here for the playoffs. Because we need him to be good. We obviously need Chris Middleton to kind of do what he did. 46%. I'll, I'll give Chris Middleton. This was a good game by Chris Middleton. I'm not going to knock Chris Middleton. I've done enough of that throughout the, the last season and this regular season. It's time to start giving this man some credit. And he had a real solid good game. He outperformed Devin Booker now. Chris Middleton both playing the two. Chris Middleton, 29 points on 46% shooting. And Devin Booker, 27 points on 38% shooting on 21 shots. So, yeah, truly outperformed Devin Booker. He was able to get to the line. And that's, oh, my God, once again, I mean, another thing to talk about, I mean, the Bucks only got to the free throw line 16 times. The Suns got to the free throw line 26 times. So once again, 10 point difference there in a 13 point game. So if the Bucks can get a couple more calls, maybe the refs can. This is a real thing that the refs talk about. How do we call the game? Um, do they call it a little less for the Suns, a little bit more for the Bucks this time, just because of the big disparity? I mean, Giannis got called for 12 free throws. Nobody else was getting called to the free throw line. Chris Middleton went to the line zero times. Zero times and he took 26 shots, folks. I mean, geez, Louise. So that's another thing that we can kind of see maybe play out is the Bucks getting to the line a couple more. And once again, free points for this Bucks team keeps the game a little bit closer. But let's go back to Drew Holiday here um, in his playoff performances. Here we go. He started big minutes every single every single game because we know Dante DiVincenzo, I believe. When did Dante DiVincenzo go down? Interesting. We'll find that out later. We don't need to go into that now. Let's just focus on Drew Holiday. So we're just going to name his points with his shooting percentage from game one all the way down to last night. And keep in mind, last night, what we are, com or yeah, yeah, uh, two nights ago. Two nights ago. Um, game one. Let's say it like that. But um, this is what Drew Holiday did, what we are comparing it to. 10 points on 28% shooting. Real abysmal. Let's see if this is the worst game. So here we go. 20 points, 50% shooting. 11 points, 41% shooting. 19 points, 70% shooting. 11 points, 33% shooting. 17 points, 36% shooting, 13 points, 60% shooting, 9 points, 28% shooting. This was game two against, or game three against the Nets. So that was abysmal. Again, real like game one. 
All right, but then we're back to 14 points on 37% shooting, 19 points on 43% shooting, 21 points on 38%, 13 points on 21%. Jeez, Louise, that's awful as well. And that was, once again, against the Nets series. So once again, solid kind of people on the perimeter. We have to kind of, you know, re-know that just James Harden, he was just standing at kind of, you know, the perimeter. So, you know, after his injury coming back from the injury for this Nets playoff series, so he wasn't 100%. He was just kind of camping on the perimeter at the three-point line. Hey, drive, but you're going to run into Blake and Kevin Durant. But I'm going to lock you up on the perimeter. And so Drew Holiday not being that greatest against the Nets. All right, but then we're at the Hawks series. 33 points on 56% shooting. 22 points on 64% shooting. 6 points on 18% shooting. 19 points on 35% shooting. 25 points on 45% shooting. And 27 points on 47% shooting. So, once again, we saw him do good against the Heat. And we saw him do good against the Hawks. Struggled against the Nets. And now struggling against Chris Paul here. So, he's been having some good games. It's like 1, 2, 3, 4-ish games where he truly floundered. Shooting the ball like low, like bad 28%. So it's not, it's more likely that he has a good game than he does have a bad game. But we have to see this Chris Paul factor and we'll know more on game two whether Chris Paul is truly locking this man down. But once again, we are going to give him the benefit of the, oh my God. And as we're talking, folks, as we're talking, people are betting the box. The value just went down. How unfortunate. We just lost value. We didn't lock it in yet. Once again, take the value. See, see what happens when you try to talk through value. You lose the value. Dang it. Dang it. Y'all, I had to talk. I had, to, I had to talk through it for y'all. Damn it. So it just went down to bucks plus four and a half. Now we lost that half a point hook. We'll still buy the half a point though. Uh, minus 121 now at bucks plus five. Minus 113 at plus four, four and a half. So that's how it goes, folks. Value slips away. Value slips away just like that. Since we're on the topic of value, so we are going to take the Bucks plus five, plus four and a half, whatever you lock it in at. We will officially lock this in at Bucks plus five, though. Uh, but since we're talking about value, let's go back. We haven't checked this in a couple of days. So let's go to this. Who is going to be the week one starter for the Bears, folks? This is easy money. It's going to be Justin Fields. We know this. It was at plus 300. We've been telling you to take it while you can get it. Get it while it's hot. Get it while that value is good. Because it's only going to go down from whenever we set it till you know, the start of training camp and the end of training camp. So let's see. Did this go down yet? Starting quarterback for the Bears. Justin Fields is still at plus 300. So, hey. Take the value. Don't miss out. You know, like we just did for the box. We just lost some value there. Get the value. Justin Fields to be the week one starter plus 300. We love it. This prob You probably have some solid weeks here to lock in this value. This value probably won't start going down until the start of training camp when we get to see Justin Fields work and play. So just be wary of that. You still have some time. But it can still just flip on a switch, folks. You can just lose it. We just lost it right in front of our eyes, folks. It can happen that quickly. So get the value. That's the lesson we always preach here. Get the value when you see it. Lock in the value, folks. So bucks plus five tonight, folks. That's what we're taking. Love it. Game two, going to be great. Let's see if Chris Paul can duplicate that performance. Let's see if Mike Bootenhauser kind of, you know, gets the defense right a little bit. And uh, let's see, Giannis, we need a little bit more out of him. We need him to be a little bit more aggressive. Got to put up like 30 points like we were used to. All right, so that's going to do it for us today. Um, let's see where these cards have finally dropped down to. We're at 350. Um, are they still in stock? Oh, no, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone, folks. They sold out. Unfortunate, but we weren't paying 350 anyway. <laughs> so, unfortunate. Once again, you know, we, we try to get too much value. See what happens? It's a, it's a real fine line, folks, between great value, bad value, and gone. So, that's the betting, folks. That's betting. That's kind of waiting. It's unfortunate. But we're not tripping. Uh, we got a backup plan, so no worries. <laughs> no worries. Alrighty, folks. That's going to do it for us today. Uh, we are back tomorrow, live noon Eastern, breaking down game two. Um, we will watch. Uh, we'll have more time in the show because we don't have to kind of talk about basketball that in depth. We will kind of cover game two. 
Uh, but we will watch the wild card game, 2016 Packers Giants, and give uh, give our score on Aaron Rodgers, and you know, doing the stories of the day, and keeping on trap top of narratives and all that. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. It doesn't seem like anything has been breaking. Um, so we will get out of here. And we will be back tomorrow, folks, live noon Eastern. We are here every day. If you ever think, hey, are they on today? We are. We are. Um, so make us your sports provider, sports commentary, sports narrative, sports talk through provider, folks. We're right here for free. For free. Jeez, we should start charging. Get it before we start charging. Get the, get the sports value before we start charging. Yeah? All right, folks. We are... Out of here.